I've moderated two panels so far, so I feel like I'm finally the bride, or one of the brides, not the bridesmaid. Um, so climate alarmists, they have a problem, presenting a consistent narrative on climate change. Instead, they seem to follow uh, the example of Lewis Carroll's irrepressible and violent uh, Red Queen down the climate change rabbit hole. Uh, in response to Alice's statement, I want you to picture Alice for a second because, I, you know, we saw Naomi Sipe this morning, and I picture her now in a sort of a pinafore dress as Alice going down the rabbit hole. Now, Alice would have made a really good scientist. She was all about curiosity. She was all about learning new things. She was about having an open mind. But yet, down the rabbit hole, she was the only person grounded, right? Uh, so yeah, picture when you're, when you're thinking of Alice down the rabbit hole, Naomi side, and she says to the Red Queen, one can't believe impossible things. And the Red Queen proudly and shockingly responded, I dare say you haven't had much practice. When I was younger, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things for before breakfast. Well, I, I can't imagine a scientific topic that that could have been written better about than climate change. Let me give you uh, a little science tutorial, and you call me out if I'm wrong. I've, I've spoken to many high school classes and some college classes, and I always start with this because I want, to, I want us to be on the same page. I want them to know that I'm not some, some lunatic. So I say, okay, you learn science. What is it about? You have a phenomena you want to explain and you develop a hypothesis about what might be happening or what might be causing it. And you go out and start looking for data and you develop a theory. And then you test your theory against the data that you can gather. And if the theory, if the, if the data seems to confirm the theory, it, it, it likely might be true. You might get others to check it out and see if they can confirm it. But if in the end the data conflicts with what you project or should or you think should be happening, then the, then the theory is probably disconfirmed and you reject the theory and you follow the data. Does anyone disagree with that, how science is supposed to work? I'm, I see no dissent. So, um, and I never see dissent in, in any of these high school classes or any of these college classes. This is what they're taught. So I say, okay, that is not how climate change science works. And uh, so I have been on the stage with seven or eight different climate scientists over my uh, way too many years of doing this. And uh, I always ask them one question. What would it take for you to believe the theory that humans are causing catastrophic climate change through CO2 emissions wrong? What would disconfirm the theory for you? Six of these scientists had no response. They couldn't think of anything for them, evidently, by their lack of response, that would disconfirm the theory. One scientist, I won't mention him by name because he's known for suing people, um, and, and I don't want to be uh, the target of a lawsuit, but he gave me an answer, and I'll give him credit for that. He said, all of physics would have to be overturned. Everything he had ever learned about physics. I said, really, the laws of conservation of energy, entropy, E, e equals mc squared, all that has to go if, for you to be wrong about climate change? And he says, yes. Well, I said, I appreciate that you have an answer. You know, he, he provided an answer. I thought it showed some extreme hubris on his part. But that's what it would take for him to be wrong about climate change. Now, one scientist gave me an answer that I thought is actually the right answer. I mean, if, there's, if there is a right answer to that question, I thought this guy had it. He said, time. Time will pass. And the projections that are made will either come to, to true or they will fail. And if they fail, the theory has to be rejected seemed really eminently reasonable to me. Uh, he, was, uh, he was actually on a panel debating will he soon at Rice. That's where I met him. But he was the only one of the eight scientists that really had a reasonable answer. Six of the scientists had no answer. That tells me that at least for those six scientists, this was not science. 
This was faith. Climate change had become a religion to them for some reason or the other. Faith can have you believe in impossible things. Science cannot. Now, let's talk about science and the impossible things. Now, I'm not talking about wrong conclusions here, but rather projecting contradictory things. Uh, back in 2009, the second national climate assessment um, uh, did regional climate modeling. And they relied primarily on two models to do their climate modeling. And one of the models predicted the Great Lakes would uh, gain height, that they would, the, the, the waters would rise in the Great Lakes. The other model said the water in the Great Lakes would fall by feet. This is all in 2080 to 2100. So one model says the lakes will be higher, one model says the lakes will be lower. The same models, one of them said the desert southwest would be more arid and desiccated. The other model said there would be more rainfall and flooding. One model said that there would be more snowfall in the Midwest and more frequent storms. The other model said it would become drier. Now, I don't know about you, but climate change might cause any one of these things to, you know, any set of these things to occur. It might cause the Great Lakes to fall or it might cause the Great Lakes to rise. It might cause more snow, it might cause less snow. It might cause a, a wetter desert southwest, it might cause a drier one. But what it can't do is cause both a wetter and drier southwest 100 years from now at the same time. It can't cause the Great Lakes to be both higher and lower 100 years from now. That's impossible. Uh, and yet, they come out with a report that said, these are what our models show, so we're just going to pick one. But if we're wrong, the other one said something else, so that's okay. That's science. What happened to if A, then B, if B, then X, Y, and Z, but not L, Q, and R. Some things got to be ruled out. You can't have impossible things. More recently, within the past year, within the, well, since 2010, there have been a lot of stories in the media based on scientific reports saying that kids won't know what snow looks like in a, in a hundred years. We just, we just won't experience snow. And then you have these great snowfalls, and England has its wetter, wettest, snowiest winter in, in uh, uh, 500 years. And then they say, climate change is causing more snow, and we expected that. <laughs> really? Because just last year you were telling me you were expecting no snow from now on. Um, in, the, in the past year, there have been reports that have come out almost within a week of each other, one saying, the monsoon rains are getting worse in Southeast Asia, and it's destroying crops, and they're going to expect it to get worse in the future. The next week, a report comes out that says, the monsoon rains are drying. It's getting less wet, and so crops are going to die in Southeast Asia, and people will have a problem growing food. And then another report came out and said, nothing much will change with the monsoon rains going forward. you got to pick one, folks you got to pick one. The problem is they've got all these models, and the models project different things. And they, being a climate alarmist means never having to say, I'm wrong. <laughs> because no matter what the projection is, no matter what actually takes place, they will find a model that actually projected that. And it may have gotten everything else wrong, but on that one point it was right, and that's the one they choose about that point. They say, see, we predicted it. Uh, the same thing with the Great Lakes, once again. Uh, there have been reports in the past two years that the Great Lakes are suffering a huge decline and it's really going to be a problem for the ports. And then what happened was the rains came and the waters rose. And then they said the Great Lakes are at their highest level in 50 years and we're really afraid they're going to wipe out the ports with flooding. You just can't have it both ways. Now, that's not science. That's A-level, National Enquirer, Amazing Creskin, crystal ball, fortune-telling stuff. It lacks the idea of causality, of if A occurs, then B and C, and D should, but not X, Y, or Z. Uh, all they have to do is say, well, this one predicted X, Y, and Z. And so we're going to go with that. Now, it's, it, what it is is it's pin the tail on the climate wheel 
It's like, put all, everything possible that could exist in the future, and we'll throw a pin, and that's what we're predicting today, but if we're wrong, we'll throw the pin again tomorrow, and we'll get the right one sooner or later. Now, uh, more recently, um, leaving aside the science question, there are also things that people believe that are impossible about energy policy. How much time do we have? Okay. Um, a Forbes article by Roger Pelkey Jr. a few years ago, he provided some interesting background information of what it would take to go to net zero by 2050. Now, he was writing, citing the British Petroleum BP Statistical Review of Energy in 2019. He noted that the world consumed 11,743 million tons of oil equivalent energy in 2018, resulting in 33.7 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions. Therefore, to reach net zero by 2050, the world would have to replace approximately 12,000 million tons of energy equivalent of fossil fuels just to meet then current energy demands. No future growth. But energy use was growing about 1.2% a year. He said, but I'm not going to account for that. We, we, we won't, we'll, we'll pretend like nothing's going to grow between now and 2050. Just to meet that. So he said a, another useful number to know is that at the time he wrote, there were 11,051 days left until January 1st, 2050. He calculated it. To achieve net zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2050 requires deploying uh, more than one million tons of carbon-free energy each and every day between now and then, starting, starting then. And that is the equivalent of a uh, nuclear power plant every six days. Or, because we all know nuclear is off the table, it would require uh, 1,500 megawatts, 1,500 2.5 megawatt wind turbines across 300 square miles of land each and every day beginning back on September 30th, 2019 when he wrote. Every, it's not the, every six days, 250 a day. So uh, that, once again, doesn't include any growth. Anyone want to guess whether we've erected 250 wind turbines a day every day since September 19, 2019? Uh, we haven't. Nor have we brought even one nuclear power plant online. And of course, every day we don't do this, we fall farther and farther behind the curve. So now we're, we, it's 250 won't be sufficient. It'll have to be 300 a day, but we're not going to get that done today. So every, it'll be 300 and a half tomorrow. That's impossible, folks. And we have to retire the equivalent amount of fossil fuel energy. So we have to put all the people out of work every day going forward till 2050 to meet net zero. That's what it takes. That's the physics of the energy transition they're demanding. Now, uh, another gentleman, Mark Mills, the Manhattan Institute, and he's at Northwestern University, he uh, talked about what it takes. And he pointed out that as the economy grows, we don't use, even as we become more efficient, we use less energy to produce more good, we're still using more energy. He says, so when the world's four billion poor people increase energy use to just one third of Europe's current energy use, uh, it would, uh, the demand for energy would rise twice the amount of America's total consumption today. One third of Europe's energy use demands twice as much as America produces today. A hundred times growth in the number of electric vehicles to 400 million on the roads by 2040 would displace just 5% of global energy demand. Renewable energy would have to expand 90-fold to replace global hydrocarbons in two decades. It took half a century to expand just 10-fold. Uh, he talks about batteries. This is a beautiful thing. We talk about batteries. So 
For security and reliability, we have an average of two months of national demand for hydrocarbons in storage at any one time. There's barely two hours of national electricity demand can be stored in all utility scale batteries and every car battery across the nation today. And to make a ba enough batteries to restore two days worth of US electricity demand would require a thousand years of production at Tesla's Gigafactory, the largest battery factory in the world. It's impossible. You can't get there from here. And that's perhaps, my, my theory is, you know, we have to erect, we have to mine all these rare earth minerals. We have to waive all the NEPA laws everywhere. We have to do so many things to even get started on this project, much less to bring it to fruition. I think that's why we, uh, the Democrats favor open borders, because we're going to have to import entire countries of people to build the wires and to construct the factories and to erect the, the, the solar. There aren't enough workers here in America if everybody else is unemployed to get this done by 2050. It will be, it will be the transcontinental railway writ large. So my conclusion, leave aside any political posturing, virtue signaling, ignore the fact that most politicians repeatedly have shown the lack of political will to get this done. When there's a little pushback, on energy taxes, uh, the yellow vest in, va in France, the riots in Chile before the climate conference that had him ca cancel the climate conference, over a small rise in fees on the transit. Uh, politicians haven't shown the political courage, the guts to get this done. So uh, the truth is, even sincere intentions to reduce emissions, even if they had the will by 2050, to reach net zero are bound to fail. The simple reality of how much energy the world demands daily and will demand in the future because in energy use is growing uh, and what it takes to produce that energy indicates we can't get there from here, as the rock band REM once sang. To believe otherwise is to believe in impossible things. According to the laws of physics and politics, it's impossible. It's an exercise in magical thinking, and all I can say is, to get this done, we need engineers from Hogwarts to get this stuff done. You've got to have somebody from uh, uh, the, what's, what's the name of the series that Hogwarts is in? Yeah, the Harry Potter series, because, you know, the engineers we have today can't get this done. Thank you very much.